in the heart of southern England is an ancient forest. A rare window into a prehistoric world that once existed across much of the British Isles. From its deep woods to its open heathland, the New Forest National Park is a landscape that has been shaped by man and animal for thousands of years. Over the coming year, I'll be journeying through the seasons, exploring the landscapes, history and wildlife. Here he comes, here he comes. And I'll be meeting the commons, who still graze their animals on the forest, following a way of life that dates back on, boy, to Neolithic on. times. You're part of a tiny it's minority. It's a really, really small community, but um, a really special community. Yeah, I think we're, we're quite proud people to, um, to be commoners. This is the remarkable story of how a landscape, its wildlife and people have evolved and continue to survive here at the edge of southern England. The first time I came to the New Forest, I was completely enchanted. I found a place without fences, where the animals roam free, and an ancient way of life still exists. For me, it evokes a deep connection. There is something here that speaks to the heart of who we are and where we have come from. How has this place survived here in the middle of southern England for so long? I'll be spending the next year finding out. It's spring, and my year starts here at the heart of the new forest on Acres Down. At the end of the last ice age, the new forest was part of a vast forest called the Wildwood stretching across southern England all the way into France. As the ice retreated and sea levels rose, part of southern England began to sink, and the forests of Doggerland were flooded, forming now what is the English Channel. But here at its edge, the new forest still stands. An oasis, cradled in the middle of the Hampshire Basin, the New Forest National Park covers an area of 566 square kilometers. It's bordered by Southampton to the east, the River Avon and Dorset to the west, and it stretches north for 23 miles towards Salisbury and Stonehenge. When hunter-gatherers arrived at the end of the last ice age, about 11,000 years ago, they would have found a world similar to this. Open woods that gave way to rough heathland and lush green meadows. The forest was a hunter's paradise. There was fresh water, firewood, shelter, and above all, there was cover to ambush your prey. This beautiful flint arrowhead was found right here, and many of them have been found across the forest floor. This place must have been alive with game. Great herds of woolly mammoth, Irish elk, and an enormous cow called the Oruk roamed here. Their constant grazing kept the forest at bay and the clearings open. They were hunted by giant cave bears, wolves, and even lions stalked this land. One of the last mammals to arrive here around 11,000 years ago was the red deer. 
weighing up to 180 kilograms and standing up to two meters tall with its antlers. This magnificent creature is now Britain's largest wild land animal. But one animal has been here for more than 500,000 years, the horse. They once roamed with the mammoth and the Irish elk across southern England. A descendant of those early equines, the new forest pony evolved as a distinct breed of moorland pony. And its relationship with man changed from being hunted to being herded. Evidence of early man is laid bare right across the forest. There are over 200 Bronze Age barrows. Here on Setley Plain are these two very rare dish-shaped barrows. Their precision and shape suggest that this land was inhabited by a sophisticated and civilized society around three to 4,000 years ago. The soil here was rich enough to support farming communities. The problem was that it quickly became exhausted and was set aside for grazing, which in turn has created a landscape and a way of life that survives to this present day. In medieval Britain, around 600 to 1100 AD, the rights to graze the land were enshrined under the feudal system. The land was owned by the crown and given under grant to the lords of the manor. The lords gave the workers who lived on their estate the right to graze their animals. They were called commoners. Remarkably, here in the New Forest, the grazing rights have remained attached to the land, much of which is still owned by the crown and the grazing rights are still used by the commoners. Today I'm meeting Mike Mayton. He's one of more than 700 commoners that keep animals on the forest. Here he comes, here he comes. Mike's about to release his prized stallion, Brooks Hill Brumby. Oh, look at that. <laughs> he looks pretty keen, Mike. He's definitely looking keen. He's keen, he's keen. There you go. What a beautiful boy. Stand up. Good boy. While the mares are out in the forest all year, the stallions are only let out for just a few short weeks in the spring. Good boy. You're going to take him in or are you going to let him go here? I'll probably just let him go here. He'll do his job. Right. I'm sure he'll know where to find him. I think he probably will. Go on then, boy. Go on. Duh. Well, he's not, uh, he's not wasting any time. <laughs> He'll spend the next few days gathering them in a herd to keep them all in sort of a, you know. He likes to keep all his ladies it, in one yes, place. All the eggs in one basket. And they won't let them wander off too much. And when one does, you know, we'll quickly round it up, you know, push it back, and make sure it knows its place to stay in the herd. He'll just mark his territory now. How he'll, will he do that? How will he I mark? mean, obviously by scent, he'll work out which ones are in season. He's doing a good job out there. He's... He is, yeah. You know, he feels like that's his property out there now. So Absolutely. They're his, they're his mares. So if any other yeah. stallion comes over from another area, they may have a bit of a ruck, but he's quite a dominant stallion. You know, he's been around, he knows the score, and, uh, and he'll quickly push them off to say, you know, this is my domain. And hopefully there'll be a fair few foals. This is the wild. Whilst we can let the stallions go, what happens from that point on? is actually something that we we can't really control. Oh, no, definitely not. And that's the beauty of it. So he'll go wherever he wants to go for the next six weeks, yeah. and he'll live wherever he wants to live for the next six weeks. We all just love this way of life, really. I just take it, it's, it's the freedom. It's just, it's the freedom. Uh, you know, yeah. you can live anywhere in the world, but I wouldn't want to change where I'm from. 
when you get brought up with it for years, the forest becomes part of you. It's hard work sometimes. It's not an easy run. I mean, this time of year, everything looks great, but we go through a long, hard winter. It's a bit like Portsmouth on a Saturday night, really. But this, this will carry on for six weeks. And then the temperature will drop a little after that, I think. Across the New Forest, the commoners graze around 5,500 ponies and 3,000 cattle. They are the architects of this landscape. A rich mosaic of rare habitats, from ancient woods to lowland heath and boggy mires to meadow pastures, the New Forest is a haven for some of our rarest and most spectacular wildlife. By grazing the hardiest of plants, gorse, bracken, heather and holly, the horses and cattle keep the scrub from encroaching, preserving the unique open nature of the forest. The way they graze and the way they browse is so different to if you turned out different type of um, animals on the forest, you wouldn't get the landscape you have today. Commoners take great pride in their animals, and the quality of the new forest pony is maintained by choosing a limited number of the best stallions. And at the annual stallion parade in Bewley, the competition is tough. Commoner Kerry Dovey was one of the judges. This is a really big day because you've got all, you know, I know there were some ladies leading their stallions, but there's a lot of testosterone and it isn't just the stallions, it's the men as well leading their pride and joy. They have got to have a nice high set tail to keep the sort of wind and rain off them and lovely and deep, a handsome head really as well. You don't want to produce ugly folds. <laughs> really good movement, they've got to chase after their mares. It's to preserve the best bloodlines and the best type of ponies. That's what we want out there. Commoning, well, you know, you can take the girl out of the forest, but you can never take the forest out of the girl. And I was born and, and brought up in the forest. And being a commoner is just, I feel very lucky and very fortunate. Thousands of years of grazing has created one of the rarest and richest habitats in Britain, lowland heath. The New Forest has the largest area of lowland heath in Western Europe. Within its dwarf forest of gorse and heather lies a magical world. As temperatures rise, many creatures emerge from their burrows after a long winter in hibernation. The new forest is home to all six species of the UK's native reptiles. One of the rarest is the sand lizard. It crawls out to warm its body in the sun. In spring, the male develops a dazzling green pattern along its flanks to attract females. Out in the open, he's dangerously exposed. The adder is Britain's only venomous snake. Mice, frogs and sand lizards are all on the menu. The rare Dartford warbler has also survived a hard winter. It lives nowhere else but on lowland heath. With spring comes an explosion of insect life and pray for the warbler to feed its young. Without the commoners and their ponies, the heathland would soon become overgrown and many of the creatures that live here would disappear. How many times have you done this? Hundreds of times. <laughs>
I'm riding out with Rob Stride, who's looking for his first bulls of the year. I reckon, I reckon there's one down in here. Down there? Yeah. Yeah. Should we go and have a look? I think that would be a grand idea. Let's do it. Oh, look at that. There they are, two mares and foals. Absolutely oh. wonderful sight. So these two mares, one's got a colt foal and one a filly. It must be good to see them. Cheers the soul when you see a foal Absolutely. prancing about in the spring. Absolutely. Full of the joys of life. Yeah. They haven't got any worries, have they? No, they haven't. Do you name them? Yes, they've all got names. Like right, that mare's Rushmore Solo. Wonderful. There's a lot of thought goes into names. And... Yeah, of course. <laughs> both my mother's family and my father's family were both common in families. So as soon as we could walk and get going, we were immersed in common in... A lot of commoners traditionally went and worked within the forest, worked for the Forestry Commission, timber cutting, bridge building, fencing, those sort of jobs. So the commoning was a bit of a sideline when they went home. They had a few cows and a few pigs, sort of, bit of it was subsistence farming, really. As we've moved into the modern world, people have got different jobs. Some people work in IT, various jobs. I mean, people do it for the love of it, really. The, the forest doesn't change, and really the common in practices, although they get some modern twists. Stallions go out, herd the mares. We still handle the ponies and the cows in the same ways. Pigs go out in the autumn with the acorn crop in the panic season. So all those things are hundreds, probably thousands of years old. We've just, we're just the next generation that's doing it. How the new forest and the commoners have survived to the present day is a remarkable story. But history has not always been kind to the commoners. When William the Conqueror invaded England in 1066, he made Winchester, just 25 miles from here, his royal seat with its huge herds of deer and the Normans' passion for hunting, William declared the New Forest Britain's first royal hunting ground. Hunting was a way of life for the Normans, a social affair. It was also a rehearsal for war. They used the same skills and weapons to bring down an animal as they did in battle. The red stag was the ultimate prize. It can run for over 30 miles or more before tiring. And for such an epic pursuit, the royal hunting parties needed a landscape that was free of fences. To protect the forest for hunting, William established the brutal forest laws. The commoners were completely crushed. They couldn't hunt, they couldn't farm the land or protect their livestock. Many people were moved from the forest. 20 villages were razed to the ground. And what was a hard life became a lot harder. The Verderer's Court in Lyndhurst is right at the heart of the New Forest National Park. It was established by William the Conqueror to strictly enforce the forest laws to ensure this land was maintained as a royal hunting ground. Incredibly, it still exists today. It was foresters and wardens who policed the forest, and they would have brought any commoners who broke the forest laws here to stand in the dock. For more serious offences, like hunting, cutting down trees, putting up fences, or impeding the hunt in any way, offenders were sent to sit in front of the justice ire in Winchester, where they faced the prospect of being blinded, having a hand cut off, being castrated, 
or even facing the death penalty. The verderers were the judges, and they would have and still do sit here, and their job was to protect the venison and the verd, the deer and the greenery. It may have been harsh justice, but William the Conqueror and his forest laws helped ensure the survival of the new forest through the Middle Ages right to the modern age. Today, the landscape remains largely unfenced and the red deer still roam free. The forest laws have long since gone, but the verderous court remains. It now serves to protect the commoning system, the livestock and the forest. It's early June, late spring, you can smell it. The air is sweet, I love this time of year. The butterflies are racing, the songbirds are singing and courting and nesting. And somewhere in this beautiful land, the deer are giving birth. Out of Britain's 24,000 species of insect, 63% are found here in the New Forest. Two thirds of all of the species of beetle are also found here. And these flowering hawthorn trees are oases of nectar for the emerging insects in the spring. Just like this absolute beauty. This is a rose chafer, and it has the most incredible life cycle. What happens in some circumstances is that the female will fly down and land near a wood ant's nest. And the wood ants will gather around her and gather her up and take her into the center of their nest. There she will lay her eggs and the larva will hatch and they sink down to the bottom of the nest where they act as cleaners for the entire colony. And in time, they will pupate and then emerge from the wood ant's nest, and the whole cycle begins again. So I'm going to put her back and let her carry on feeding on this precious nectar. And we are dying. The woods are also home to the most feared predator in the forest, the goshawk. With a wingspan of up to 1.5 meters, it weaves silently between the trees, snatching birds out of the air and squirrels from branches. Today, I'm catching up with Head of Wildlife Management for the Forestry Commission, Andy Page. Andy and his team have been studying the goshawks here since 2002. Any idea how many yet, Andy? A female and two males. How wonderful. The team okay. have recorded almost every goshawk chick born in the forest since the project started. Wonderful birds. Yeah. Wonderful birds. Almost driven to extinction in the 19th century, they're now making a strong comeback. Yeah. Two boys and a girl. How many nest sites are there now? In the New Forest, there's probably about 40 pairs, but they're also spreading out of the forest now. I mean, the forest is the nucleus, really, for recolonization of the south of England. So this one you can see quite easily take a squirrel or a jay or a magpie, a jackdaw, crow. What about the, the other raptors? What about the kestrels and sparrowhawks? How have their numbers, as a result of the recovery of the goshawk, have they declined? But the thing that they're really doing is out-competing them. So basically, when the food starts to get scarce, these are just so much more efficient than all the others that, so, that they survive. And the so others she, are... she is head of the food chain here? Yes, 100%. She is, yes, she is the yes. fiercest predator yes, within the forest. Yes. 
Did you hear that? You are. God, you're beautiful. What a privilege. Unlike most birds of prey, they will actually land and they will go into a bramble bush and carry on hunting, which is why they're just so efficient. Because you don't want one chasing you if you're, if you're a small bird. Well, <laughs> no, not if you're a small bird, no. In an area where many birds are declining, this, the goshawk is a success story and it's wonderful, wonderful that they are here and go well. The New Forest has the highest concentration of ancient trees in Western Europe. Some of the oaks here date back more than 600 years. But this is also a working forest, and it has played a pivotal role in our history. Forester Simon Holloway works for the Forestry Commission who manage the majority of the land in the New Forest National Park. The Navy in the 16th and 17th century, they had a team of what were known as regarders, they were surveyors, who would come out into the forest and inspect the crop and see what we had and how many trees we had to create so many ships for the future. And this tree here? Yeah. What, what do you see? If you, if you were a regarder, what would you see? looking up at this tree. Again, you've got those lovely arched boughs here that they could have they could have used for the side of the ship. You've got a lovely V there that you could have probably used as like a bracket. And you've got that natural sort of V-like structure with the fibers of the tree running together and joining naturally. So you've got a lot of natural strength in that. You didn't have to make it. It was there already. Oh, and they would have they would have melded it in a in a in a more organic way. So they would have probably heated it up and yeah. bent it yeah. and, and and, and carved it to get the perfection of it in the ship. But they would have seen that raw element within the tree itself. Oh, yeah. wonderful. The Navy were fully aware that, you know, there's only a finite amount of, of timber in the country for a smallish island. And they knew that if they didn't start planting uh, in a systematic way, they would be out of timber. So they were saying, look, if we don't start planting trees now, we're not going to be able to keep the momentum of the shipbuilding to keep expanding the empire at the time. I look at these trees and I think, this is natural, but have human beings had a hand in, in, in the shape of that tree there? Let's take that tree. Yes, down. yeah, yeah, absolutely. We would have planted them probably about two metres apart, either yeah. as an acorn or as a, as a, as a grown Little seedling, yeah. Um, and then once they get up to probably about 50 years of age, they would have started respacing them. So taking out competition, taking out the poorer ones, taking out the ones that didn't conform to the shape that they wanted. Mm. So they would nurture them, just like you would nurture a vegetable plot mm. and respace yeah. your carrots to get yeah. the ones that you want. Yeah. If we hadn't had these woodlands on our doorsteps, we probably wouldn't have grown the empire uh, that we, you know, we, that we developed over the course of history. And so I'm wandering through this thinking, oh, this is incredible, natural environment, bluebells, birdsong. Yeah. But actually, human beings have created this. We have. Up to 5,000 trees could be used to build a battleship. And the timber, was hauled out of the forest by ponies and oxen to Bewley and the shipbuilding yard here at Buckler's Hard. The proximity of the forest, deep water channel and gravel banks made Buckler's Hard a natural choice for early shipbuilders. The word hard is actually a Hampshire word and it's used to describe gravel banks where ships can be hauled in and out of the water. The shipyard came to national prominence in 1744 when Henry Adams, the master builder from Deptford Dockyard, moved and set up business here. Over the following 60 years, he supervised the building of 43 Royal Naval vessels, including HMS Euryalus and Swiftshaw, both of which fought in the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. But the most famous ship that he built was HMS Agamemnon. It was Admiral Lord Nelson's first command, and it was said 
to be his favorite ship. But you have to imagine this place 200 years ago, 250 years ago. There would have been wood piled up against all of these houses. And you can tell this is a working village because there are no front gardens. This was a place where ships were built and that was all that it was. This would have been completely bustling with noise and sound, hammering, shouting, ringing. Incredible. It's summer, and across the park, visitors arrive. It's time for commoner Bill Howells to bring in the hay. Some commoners keep a few fields at the edge of the forest to grow for them, to feed their cattle in the winter months. Bill and his family have kept ponies and cattle on the forest for 45 years. You're part of a tiny it's minority. A, a really special community, I think. The New Forest I see is one massive farm that we all share, really. Yeah. Um, we've kind of all got that little section that's, you know, near to our house. Mm. Um, and a lot, lot of our animals tend to stay near to our house. And mm. um, I mean, like the ponies, we call it their haunt. It's that sort of sense of ownership and pride, mm. you know, about sort of turning your animals out onto the forest and, mm. and the benefit that that brings then to the forest as well. So, mm. um, yeah, I think we're, we're quite proud people to, um, to be commoners. But they face many great challenges. Commoning rights are attached to property. And like many commoners, Bill rents his home from the Forestry Commission but affordable rental property is fast declining, and house prices on the open market are now the most expensive in all of the UK's national parks. I, I really fear a bit for commoning because a lot of the holdings, the private holdings, have been sold away. I, you know, I think it's getting harder and harder for our children to, to sort of find a place, find a holding and get going, really. August arrives. There's been no rain for three months. The grasslands are parched. And most of the streams have dried out. The New Forest is in the grip of the most extreme heat wave since 1976. And I'm here to meet Rob, just to have a bit of a catch up to see what's happening on the land. It's dry, mate. Yeah. Really dry. Yeah. I mean, we had one of the wettest winters on record, didn't we? Yeah. We were praying for this sort of weather. We were. And we've got our wish. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've had unbroken sunshine since May. Yeah, we have. No meaningful rain at all. Nothing. Yeah, I mean, parts of it look like Africa. Yeah. We're very lucky, as commoners, that we have got the forest to fall back on because there's no grass in the fields, really. You've got so many different um, places. that You've got the high heath and then you've got the valley mires that are wet, wet yeah. places. I mean, the animals, that's where they're grazing at the moment. They're down in the, the places where the moisture is. Yeah. I mean, they've evolved over hundreds of years to know where to graze. What happens if, you know, we get to another five weeks towards the end of August and there's still not a drop of rain? Food will get short. I mean, the forest has not got an endless supply of grass. Um, you get on that time of year, probably the ponies will eke it out because they look, look well anyway and the, yeah. cows, the cows will have to come in and we'll have to start supplementary feeding them probably. Um, which eats into your winter supplies. It's going to say it'll be a long winter. Makes a long winter. The drought doesn't stop one of the greatest spectacles in the forest. A flush of purple covers the heathland. The 
heather is in flower. This landscape is so extraordinary because it's just completely different every day. There is something happening every day. I mean, to be a commoner and live here would just get inside you. It's going to get inside your soul. It's going to get inside your heart. And it's exquisite. It's exquisite. There are three types of heather here. Crossleaf heather, bell heather, and this one. This one here. This, this is Coluna vulgaris, ling heather. Coluna comes from the Greek word, which means to brush, a reference to its use in making brooms. Ling heather was also a very important part of the local economy. It was used for making baskets, to thatching, bedding, and fuel. And the tips of these flowers make a delicious heather tea and a very heady heather ale. The heather is a rich source of nectar for many insects that survive nowhere else but on lowland heath, including the silver-studded blue butterfly. The male lives for just a few weeks. His sole purpose is to find a female. Once they've mated, she crawls down into the heather to lay her eggs. Lowland heath is also critical habitat for ground nesting birds and rare waders, like the curlew. Its numbers are in steep decline. The new forest is one of its last strongholds. And as the sun sets, it's a chance to see an elusive visitor from Africa. I have always wanted to hear a nightjar. All my years, Never heard one, never seen one. But tonight is the night jar night. I'm hoping Andy Page can help. There's something about them that's a bit captivating. They come out just when we're losing our ability to see them. And yeah. Yeah, they're very cryptically camouflaged, so you, can't, you need a certain amount of luck to see them. Yeah. I think he's probably down on one of those little trees there. It's a trap there. Amazing sound of Africa transported here to this small island. I think it's going to be very difficult to see them, but we can definitely hear them. Definitely hear them. Just past that little pine, in between those two clumps of gorse just there. Has it gone back down again? Has it gone away? Yeah. Just flew up. Yeah. Just there. there he is. Do you see him? Can you hear me? There he is. It's just there. They've got a bit of a hawk. They've got a bit of a owl. Yeah. They, they flick about silently like an owl a lot of the time. Yeah. So. There's something so reassuring about the fact that they're just here. They're yeah. Here. There he is. Right there. Look at that. Look, look, look at that. Beautiful. Look at that. Eh? Oh. Lovely little finale for us, wasn't it? Did you see yeah. that? Oh, it landed on your head, didn't it? That was extraordinary. I don't know who was more surprised, the, the night jam or us there. Yeah. A final flurry. Yeah. Yeah.
it's late August, and after three months, the rain finally returns. You wouldn't know it, but the new forest is peppered with over 1,000 ponds, and there are more wet bogs here than anywhere else in Northwest Europe. The reason why these valleys hold all of this water is because just under the surface here, just under the surface, right across this valley, is a hard, impervious layer of clay. And the water is funneled down into these valleys here, which form these bogs, these wonderful bogs and mires. As you can see, These freshwater habitats are of international importance for wildlife and are home to some of our rarest plants and insects. The sundew is perfectly adapted for life on these nutrient-poor soils. Its leaves have evolved into a sticky lure. They close around their insect prey and digest and extract all the minerals they need. Nearly 75% of the UK's dragonflies are found in the new forest. The largest is the golden ring dragonfly. Lords of the air, they can catch wasps in mid-flight. The bogs here are also one of only two places where you can find our largest grasshopper, the extremely rare large marsh grasshopper. It's these watery places, which even in the most arid of times, continue to exist and continue to flow and do the work of giving life to this national park. Across the heathland, ponds and mires flow into streams. With so little agriculture, they are some of the cleanest in Britain. through the woods and join the forest's two main rivers, the Limit and the Bugle. Just 14 miles downstream, the Limington reaches the Solent. I had no idea that any of this was here, but from Hearst Castle in the east to Southampton Water in the west, this stretch of the coast is all part of the New Forest National Park. And it is also one of the most important wetlands in Europe. Every year, thousands of waders, wildfowl, and gulls fly in, some from as far as Siberia, to feed and breed here. The sandwich turn comes from as far away as South Africa. The outlying islands are one of the few places in southern England where seabirds can nest safely from land predators like the fox. The ebb and flow of the tide provide a rich soup of plankton, a feast for all the worms, shellfish, shrimp and fish that are thriving here. And they in turn provide food for all the seabirds. The shingle, mudflats, and salt marsh support avocets, curlew, and many other rare waders. And for the heron, there's the occasional eel. As September arrives, so begins one of the busiest times of the year for the commoners. The annual drifts begin. It's time to round up the ponies in the new forest. Drift means to drift. 
strike or hurl on a given day. More than 40 take place across the New Forest. Riding at full gallop, it's highly skilled and dangerous work. Most of the commoners have ridden since they were just a few years old. This is a time of the year that everyone gets together. Um, we do it as a unit. You're galloping as fast as your horse can across rough terrain. Um, and you get, you, you know, you catch the ponies. Your horse is still stood up. You're still on. Yeah, you, you can't beat it. Some of the younger commoners are just starting out. This is terrifying. You've just got to get on with it. And you've got to holler, like, just get the ponies in. That is the aim. <laughs> I love this time of year. We're just on the cusp of autumn and the trees are heavy with beech nuts, chestnuts and acorns and the birds are feasting on blackberries, sloes and elderberries. And as the first acorns fall, it sounds the starting gun for another ancient custom within the forest, the panage, when the commoners release their pigs into the forest to feast on all of this bounty. Johanna and Phil Stride have been following a tradition that dates back to well before the time of William the Conqueror. It's time to let the pigs out. the pigs roam free across the forest and it doesn't take them long to find what they're after. Free food. And exactly. Free it's, food, it's free chucker. It's free food. I haven't got to feed them at home. Yeah. And um, the more they eat, the better out here, really. Another good thing is that they're, they're taking acorns away from the ponies and cattle, right. which is um, a very good thing because the acorns are poisonous. I think it's a form of colic that they get that, that kills them off. It and kills them? Yeah, yeah, it can kill, kill, kill a large number of, of ponies and cattle in a heavy mast year. You can lose up to 100 stock across the forest. I'm completely unaware of Yeah, it's a problem that the commoner has to face. There is something ancient that is still happening, They're working with the seasons, working with the land, and accepting what is being given. And, um, living around those rhythms. We love pigs. We just love them. Across the forest, autumn takes hold. The red stag gathers his harem. His call echoes across the forest. With autumn comes an explosion of fungi. Home to many rare and endangered species, it is one of the most important areas for fungi in Europe. The hidden heroes of the forest, they decompose plant matter and recycle nutrients back into the soil. 
What I love about this time of year is the smell in the air. Yes. I'm here to meet my you colleagues, smell the Dr. Smell Dr. Eric the Yanker. They are busy doing their digesting job. Now this is a thing of beauty. Yes. Here we have the, the, the Amanita uh, muscari, the fly agaric. And of course it's related to the, the death cap. It's the classic mushroom. It's there absolutely. on Christmas Day. Absolutely. It's, it's what anybody says a mushroom, that's what they think of. It's this beast. Not to be trifled with, it's, it's hallucinogenic and poisonous. There are what? There are 3,000 species of mushrooms in the forest? Uh, about that, yes. The recorded species. We're finding new ones every year. Really? Uh, Still? Oh, yeah, yeah. See ya. Does that um, fill you with joy? It fills me with joy. It's, it's fantastic. It's what keeps me going. It, it, it is a bit like looking for, uh, looking for candy in a, in a sweet joy. It's, you're going out finding new stuff. I was reading recently that within a wood, trees are communicating with each other via fungi. Classically, they have a relationship with the tree where the, they supply the tree with hard to find nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and water, and the tree will supply them with sugars because they can't produce sugars any other way. You see, these are just fruiting bodies. Mm. Most of the fungus is down there and it's the thin tubes that form the fungus. It's very difficult to study because it's all happening down there. That changes completely the way we look at a forest and yes. understand a forest. Yes. Yeah. That the trees are no longer insular, isolated beings. That's right. They are all deeply connected to each other. How a wood works, I think, is uh, the idea that it's based on plants and a few animals is missing the point. There's a lot of fungus going on in there. Yeah. Autumn heralds the last big event on the commoner's calendar. I'm here at the Bewley Road, pony sales. Most of the drifts are now complete, and today they're auctioning the folds. And it is a privilege to be here. This is the gathering of the commoners, a gathering of country people, all in one place ready to actually see the fruits of their labor from the year. And it's really also a social event, uh, one of the big social events of the year. And nine, thank you, 300, steady down. We haven't got the ambulance here, 300 guineas. It's just a delight, but don't scratch your nose. No. <laughs> Otherwise, you might end up with a donkey. There we are, another pretty cold and nice and quiet on the road. Good, strong coal. We're going to be, we've got 30 guineas to go, surely. 30 bit, thank you. 30 guineas. All these commoning families have brought their foals to be sold today, and many children will go home with their first pony. This is the continuation of a tradition that is earthed, earthed in this land. 200 guineas at 200 on the gelding, 210, 210, 220, 230. The future holds many challenges for the new forest. With more than 13 million visitors a year, it's increasingly hard for wildlife to escape the impact of people. And the commoner's ancient way of life is threatened. We've got enough young commoners around, like the, the sons and daughters of practicing commoners, but it's been out of point them a holding of their own to be able to practice from. We're a pretty stubborn bunch. Commoners are usually find a way. You've just got to do it. The only way commoning is going to continue is if young commoners are encouraged and supported, and it's quite scary, but so it's got to be done. It's a way of life. Winter arrives. The ponies will stay out on the forest. Some are carrying next year's folds.
their sleek summer coats are gone, and their thick shaggy hair now protects them from the cold and the rain. Cherished by the commoners for over a thousand years, their hardiness, agility and intelligence has enabled them to survive here for over 500,000 years. They turn to the gorse and heather for fodder. As my year draws to a close, the heathland burns begin. It's a practice the commoners have been following for hundreds of years. Now managed by the Forestry Commission, they burn 2% of the heathland every year. The fires rejuvenate the land. It fosters new growth of gorse and heather for the animals to graze in the spring. And it provides new habitat for the rare heathland wildlife that lives here. The animals burrowed beneath the ground will re-emerge in the spring. What you have here is a deep relationship with the land. And this is so rare in our day and age. This land cared for, tended for generations by a very small group of people have made it and kept it as it is. Long may they thrive. Long may they thrive. <laughs>